All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> <laughs> that keynote this morning was fantastic. That's going to be tough to follow. <clears throat> now, I'm going to be spending a lot of time today talking about technology, but this isn't really a technical talk. It's much more human than that. Um, there are some parts of this talk that are quite painful for me personally. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that bit or skip it, but we'll see when the time comes. But I'm here with a few of my closest friends, so you, know, you can help me through it. Now, sometime in the early 2000s, probably around 2001, 2002, I met a couple of guys, um, Nick and Chris Fryer, and um, they were brilliant. Um, they had been studying IT and multimedia at Swinburne, and I hired them at my software company to work as web developers. They worked on a few projects for me. Um, they did really well. And they decided that they wanted to start their own web development business. So they went off and did that. <clears throat> and that went pretty well until they um, realized that the worst part of business is having customers. So <laughs> they decided to stop doing that. And um, they, but I, I stayed in touch with them. And they were always busy. They were working on really cool projects. They were coding things, they were designing things, building things. They got into 3D design. And um, so I was always watching what they were doing and the projects they were working on. And um, about 10 years ago, when um, Andy Jelmy founded the Melbourne Hackerspace, CCHS, first in his garage and then in a dedicated space, Nick and Chris came along to visit and they really liked what they saw. But it was a little bit too far for them to travel conveniently. And um, with Andy's encouragement, they uh, founded Melbourne Eastern Suburbs Hackers and basically created their own hacker space that was uh, more conveniently located to them. <clears throat> and Mesh has now grown into a vibrant community that uh, in, is, has regular meetings and is involved in lots of community events. So they were very deeply involved in the uh, in the, uh, the maker movement. So I don't know whether you noticed, but they are in wheelchairs. That's because they have a genetic condition called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a condition that causes wasting of muscles. And as it progresses, uh, people who have this condition lose strength, usually by about the age of 12 or so, um, they lose the ability to walk and require a wheelchair. And then as it progresses further, uh, more uh, issues arise, such as difficulty breathing. Uh, as the intercostal muscles in the chest um, begin to lose strength and the diaphragm loses strength, until eventually um, ventilation is required to assist with breathing. And um, this hasn't stopped them from doing things. They've been uh, extremely active, getting out, building things. And in late 2017, um, Nick, who is on the left in the red jacket, put a post on Facebook saying that he wanted someone to help him with some soldering and building some projects. He'd been working on projects with his carers and with his stepfather, Peter, and they'd built some incredible things, but he needed just someone to help with the electronic side of it. So, of course, I said, pick me, pick me, and um, he did. And so we got started on working on a few things that he'd had in his mind. Now. The first thing we worked on was to make a little space heater. And this is directly related to the, um, the condition with the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One of the issues is that as you lose muscle mass and the ability to uh, stimulate muscles, you lose the ability to shiver. And if you have gone out on a cold day, and on a really cold day, and you try to use a pen, for example, to write something, you don't have dexterity, your hands sort of feel stiff and sore. So the way we overcome that, of course, is that our body generates more heat, it's circulated, and we stay warm. With muscular dystrophy, uh, the body loses that ability. So what we did was make a little um, space heater which used an array of resistors and um, took power from the wheelchair and then blew uh, through it with a, um, a little computer fan, essentially. It's got a microcontroller on it with a thermistor. And um, this was generating heat that could be used to blow onto their hands. The problem they had was when they went out on a cold day, they would be driving the wheelchair with the joystick. 
um, which is an incredibly sensitive joystick. It's um, a whole effect system that only requires about 10 millimeters and a few grams of force to um, achieve full deflection. But they would lose control of their wheelchairs. So we built these little heaters. And uh, this is a picture of one attached to, uh, I think this is Nick's chair. And um, it's exactly <laughs> where I'm not pointing in this picture. It's the silver box that you can see with the grills on it. So the case was designed by Nick in Fusion 360 and sent off to a laser cutter. So it was cut out of um, brushed stainless steel and then folded. And uh, so inside that is the little heater uh, that we designed. And it blows directly onto his hand where it's over the, um, over the joystick. And you can see a couple of touch switches there that we'll get back to in a moment as well. And um, they also use them just when they're stationary. We have some heaters set up on a desk. Uh, this is Chris using his computer. And you can see that there is one heater blowing on his left hand and another one blowing across on his right, which is sitting on a mouse. And you'll also see a blue box down the bottom, uh, which we will get back to a little bit later in the talk, because that's very important. So this was the first thing that we worked on together. And um, it's, been a, um, a, it's made a real difference in their ability to get out on cold days. And um, there are now other people using this as well. It's being um, trialled by a couple of people. And uh, so, of course, with my background, as many of you would know, I have a YouTube channel called Super House. I work on hacking your house and making it do what you want. Um, one of the things we looked at was how do you use uh, normal off-the-shelf home automation products and IoT devices to help make your life better. And of course, this is an area where things have changed radically compared to a few years ago. Um, not many years ago, if you started talking about home automation, you were talking about $100,000 budgets sort of at the beginning point and massive rewiring of your house. Now with consumer devices like LifeX Globes, you can retrofit very quickly and then achieve control uh, from something like a smartphone. So for someone who um, has trouble getting up to access light switches, or for example, something like a Nest video doorbell, um, I can jump up and run to the door if the doorbell rings, but if you're in a situation where it is harder to, um, to get to the door, something like a video doorbell with remote lock activation is fantastic. And um, just as a, a slight aside, how many people here remember the Leo stick from many years ago? Yeah, cool. I have it. <laughs> Still have it. Cool. I still use mine. <laughs> well, um, the tie into LifeX here is that uh, for the Kickstarter <coughs> launch of LifeX, uh, the prototype for that was built by Andy and uh, by John Boshua uh, based around the Leo stick. So LifeX is kind of um, LCA's fault in some small way at least. Um, so that sort of thing uh, proved to be uh, a really big benefit. But even with that, there are some little issues. And when you are working on things like user interfaces, there are a lot of things that you can't really put yourself into everybody's shoes. And so there are some little things that can bite you. Uh, for example, the way Nick and Chris control their, the touch screens on their phones is with a Bluetooth link from the uh, joystick on their wheelchairs. And so what, we, what they can't do is click and drag. And with touch interfaces, they very much assume a click and drag interaction at this point. So for example, with the LifeX interface, um, they can turn the globe on and off. They can click different parts of that color spectrum and change the color. But the center point of this interface is a little wheel that goes up and down to change the level of illumination. And that is, requires a drag. So they can't actually change the level of illumination, just the color and turning it on and off. Now, there may be ways around that, but this was just one of the, the little examples um, that we came up against. And um, so what we did was set up a system running OpenHab on a, um, a board I designed, uh, which integrates uh, power management and radio um, transmission and reception with a Raspberry Pi. And then we linked that, and we experimented with linking that to different devices, including the LifeX Globes and other things. And um, another little project that I worked on is a device that allows you to take any arbitrary remote control, like a garage door remote. You open it up, attach it to this board. This has an ESP8266 underneath it. 
and you wire in a couple of outputs to your transmitter and it logs into MQTT, so all of a sudden you can take an arbitrary radio control device and turn it into an IoT device and link it to your home automation system. So in this particular case, that's a garage door remote control attached to it. And uh, the reason the board is that weird shape is that it clips into a little plastic case, so it actually looks like a nice little commercial device when it's all put together. Uh, but once again, this sort of building block can be really useful in tying different devices from around the house together. So one of the things that uh, Nick was really interested in was taking more control of his wheelchair. And um, they had recently got new wheelchairs and um, the, the wheelchairs they'd just received cost around $45,000 each. And we didn't want to mess around with those too much, but they had the previous wheelchairs so what we did was started using those as test platforms. And getting information about how things like wheelchairs work is really difficult because nobody wants to share that. And um, the only information you can find is work that other people have put into reverse engineering what goes on. So the very first thing we wanted to do was to be able to uh, intercept the communications between the control system and uh, the joystick and the main controller of the chair. So we made up a little breakout and um, started pr probing around and trying to figure out what the signals were. And um, after a fair bit of messing around, we discovered that it was a fairly bizarre system where the controller supplies a reference voltage and then the joystick splits that reference voltage in half and then it returns to X and Y values which are based on deltas to that reference voltage. So we ended up um, figuring this out eventually and we got it to the point where we could fake out the chair controller and uh, by sending a, um, a signal to it we could make it think that we had the regular joystick plugged in and we could drive the chair essentially. So this was stage one. And, um, at this point I had X and the x-axis reverse so push right and it goes left but <laughs> we had achieved some degree of control. So what we really wanted to do was allow Nick and Chris to use the controls that they can access, which are the ones built into their chair, to reach out and control the world around them. So we wanted to do the opposite. We wanted to be able to take that um, user action and then send it elsewhere. But now we knew how the signal worked from the, um, the chair so we could intercept it. So our first attempt at doing this was a bit of a cobbled together mess, but it actually, surprisingly enough, worked. So in that, uh, that big beige box that's sort of sitting across to the left, there is an Arduino, and that is intercepting the control signals, and then it's sending PWM outputs into a hacked FlySky transmitter. Now, one of the things that Nick and Chris used to do when they were younger was um, play computer games and drive remote control cars and fly remote control aircraft. And this, they were activities that were essentially equalizers. It was something that they could do <clears throat> at the same level as everybody else. So as their condition progressed and they lost the ability and the strength to, uh, to control the joysticks on a transmitter, that was something that was taken away from them and it had a really big psychological impact. So um, Nick in particular was was very good at racing remote control cars and he used to um, compete quite regularly. And um, so they were very keen to do that. And um, uh, basically within five minutes of us getting this working, he was saying, quick, let's get outside, let's get outside. So uh, this is, I believe, driving a car from his wheelchair for the first time in many, many years. is begin to give them control that they hadn't had. And um, that has a really profound psychological impact. <clears throat> so there were many other projects we worked on as well. Um, 
Nick was really interested in robotics and using robotics as an outreach tool. He wanted to be able to use it to inspire um, kids in particular to get into IT. So this is a project that we started working on that he designed. Um, it was, the base was laser cut on his laser cutter. And then um, we 3D printed the body that he designed as well. And um, it has a mount on the top so that it can have a LiDAR on it. And this was designed to be a platform for ROS, Robot Operating System. Standard beverage of choice, and um, stage of actually fitting the lidar and um, setting up all of the autonomous control. And um, shortly after this, I turned up at his house one day, and he had a bee in his bonnet that he desperately wanted to build a donkey car. And um, so this was middle of last year, and but. Nick's an impatient sort of guy. He couldn't be bothered waiting for the 3D printed chassis that normally you know, sits on top of it. That takes so long. So he very quickly designed this laser cut plywood chassis uh, in Fusion 360. Um, he sent the files over the network to the laser cutter in his garage. And I walked over and picked them up and stuck them together. And within the space of a few hours, we had a, an operational donkey car. So for those of you who came to the Open Hardware Miniconf, um, the timing of this project may have had some influence on the decision. Um, it was around about that time that Andy was suggesting, um, I think it was Andy suggested the donkey car. And uh, the positive experience that we had with this was, was something that really made us think that, yes, this is a good thing to pursue. But through this time, we were still working on the, um, the human interface side of it, how to take the signals from the wheelchair controls and then send them to something else. And we, we got really sick of jumper wires falling out of breadboards and things. So we rapidly progressed through a sequence of um, PCBs to try to make it a bit more efficient. The, um, the PCB on the left is essentially the first generation. And that is really just taking what we did have as a big jumper wired mess and turning it into a breakout board. So you just stick an Arduino on top. Um, it takes up to two joysticks as input. So you can have up to four axes. You need three axes to fly a drone. So what we wanted to do was have a joystick on each side to enable uh, Nick and Chris to fly drones, um, which we did actually achieve. And the output goes to either a FlySky transmitter, or it can emulate a human interface device like a game controller. So we could then interface with uh, something like a, a computer or a game console. We then discovered that we needed trim adjustment. So we made the uh, version you see in the middle which basically just added some pots on it so we could trim out the different axes and um, stabilize whatever we were controlling. And they proved that um, the whole concept was viable. So we then moved to the version you see on the right where we integrated everything onto the same, onto one board. So the microcontroller and everything is on there. It's got a, um, an ATmega 32U4 on it, same as an Arduino Leonardo. So essentially that looks like an Arduino Leonardo from a software point of view but it has an input that comes from the joystick on the chair, it has an output that goes to the chair controller, and it allows us to put the chair into a mode where we, um, we immobilize it and then send the signal somewhere else. And we can do whatever we like with that. Now, one of the big steps we made with this last design was that we added CAN bus support. So CAN is a um, communications bus which is designed for industrial environments. It's typically used in cars. It's used a lot for UAVs and industrial robots and that sort of thing. And it's a very reliable way of sending um, serial communications to multiple devices. And uh, this is a picture of the, our board on the bottom right communicating via CAN for the first time. And um, so that opens up a whole lot of possibilities. One thing is that modern wheelchairs have CAN buses on them. So when you look at a $45,000 wheelchair, it's an incredibly sophisticated piece of equipment. It's got um, computers controlling the drivetrain and um, all sorts of stuff going on. So firstly, we wanted to be able to interface with that, if possible. And secondly, we wanted to use CAN for our own purposes. And um, so we designed a little box for it. And it's a total fluke that that looks like a robot face. <laughs> <laughs> 
I had no idea when we were laying it out that that's what it would look like, but it looks kind of like Bender. That's what it reminds me of. Um, so we, um, we figured out how to mount this on the chair, and the idea is that this is something that can be made as a permanent addition to the wheelchair, and then it can be operated in two different modes. You can run the chair in regular mode, and it just passes a signal straight through, or you can have it in the interception mode where the chair won't move and the signal goes to whatever we want, either via CAN or via uh, USB. So it can be like a game emulator. And um, if you look on the inside of the FlySky transmitter, uh, which we hacked in the first place, this is what a stock unmodified transmitter looks like. Um, what we did originally was modify it with a little RC filter network so that we could fake out the joystick positions. So in the first version I showed you, what we were doing is sending PWM signals into the transmitter, which were then being filtered to make them nice and smooth instead of jagged. And when the switch was flipped on the transmitter, it would accept the signals from the wheelchair instead of the controller itself. So what we could do is have an operator use the transmitter and control the model and then simply flick a switch and control is then given to the chair controls. You flick the switch and it comes back again. So it allows someone um, using chair controls to cooperate with someone else um, to control the device. But this is a bit of a mess. So the next thing we started working on is this little board which is designed to fit into the back of the FlySky transmitter and it gives it a CAN bus interface. So this is the FlySky transmitter with the little CAN board on it. And as you can see, there are some bodge wires on there. We're still working on that design. But there is a header on the, on the motherboard for the, um, the transmitter, which is a debug header. It gives us ground and power and uh, some interesting things. So what we can do is connect straight into that. Um, but I thought it would be appropriate to let Nick uh, give a little demonstration, of, well, to talk Hello, about uh I've been, been working on this system for a while. Uh, it, uh, with John, and um, basically it takes the analog output from the wheelchair joystick. It allows you to uh, um, switch it. So you can plug in like a game controller or a, uh, you can use it to fly radio controlled uh, devices uh, like drones or planes or cars but uh, there's all sorts of other more useful functions that it could do, um, like, perhaps driving an actual car. He's got a bit of a cheeky grin at the end there. <laughs> um, so this is him using the same board but in hid emulation mode, so it's pretending to be a game controller and um, using a driving game on his computer with the joystick attached to the wheelchair. So this is the first time that he had proportional control of a computer game for many years. Um, now returning to the outreach theme, one thing that Nick was really keen to do was build some little combat robots. There was an event coming up <laughs> called the Stringy Bark Festival and um, he wanted to see kids driving ant weight combat robots. So he designed these in, once again, in Fusion 360. He sent the files off to his laser cutter in the garage. I went and picked them up and then basically glued all the pieces together. It's, um, it's a really cool design. It comes together as a little wedge with a flipper on it. And uh, the, uh, the idea was that we could just um, give kids the controls for it. They couldn't do too much damage, but they'd have a lot of fun. And um, so, this gets to the point that um, this slide is blank because I wasn't sure if I could talk about this, but I'll, I'll do it. Um, those pictures that I just showed you of the, the robot chassis being put together, that was on a Thursday afternoon. And 
while Nick and I were sitting uh, working on this, we were just chatting about life, the universe, and everything, like a typical conversation. And um, at one point, um, he said, uh, he told me three things very specifically, and pretty much this directly. Firstly, <clears throat> he wanted to live forever. <laughs> So he just wanted to hang on for long enough for, um, for consciousness upload technology to be around and then he'd be free. Um, the second thing was he was sure he had a, a purpose in life, but he just didn't know what it was yet. And um, he, he would just keep doing things in the meantime until he figured it out. And the third thing was <clears throat> he might die in the process of achieving that goal, but that was okay with him as long as it had some good result. And um, you know, he was thinking maybe he could be involved in some uh, medical trials that would assist with you know, electrode technology or something like that, um, for, that would then cause benef you know, be beneficial to other people. Um, so that was on a Thursday afternoon. And um, that weekend, uh, as he was um, being got up out of bed by his carer, he had a respiratory event and um, lost consciousness. And um, his carer and his stepfather, Peter, uh, applied CPR, but they couldn't revive him. Sorry. Um, so, so he passed away a little, uh, a few days later. But um, after this, the Stringy Bark Festival was still coming up and Peter, um, Chris and I all talked about it and um, we said that it was Nick's dream to encourage people and to have them be inspired to try things. So we wanted to finish his projects for him. So um, we fin over the space of the next couple of weeks, we finished putting together his robots. And this was the... his design worked brilliantly. And um, a couple of weeks after he died... So at this point, I was very worried about Chris because I wasn't sure how he, would, um, how he would deal with the situation. I didn't know if he would go into um, a funk and withdraw, but it turns out that he didn't. He's, um, he's really strong and so he was determined to complete Nick's projects and many of his own as well and he wanted to get right back into it. So we immediately started working on a couple of things um, that had been started by Nick and some ideas of um, Chris's as well. And the, um, one of the first things we started looking at is the touch switches on his wheelchair. So I'll let These are touch switches. They make it easy for me. To control my wheelchair. For example, this button, switch modes, so I can do things like this, or to the switch to the back. It allows me to do it by just click to the stuff like that. Take photos, play games, whatever. It's extremely useful and uh, without it. I would be able to use my 
Fall. Das wird sich nicht das Ding bewegen. Das, das ist für mich ist. Um, yeah, there are, there are a couple of issues. Um, there are two I'm going to talk about. Um, the first is that they, these little touch switches are battery powered. Um, they are supplied by the manufacturer of the wheelchair and depending on the physical requirements of the user, the chair is customized so that the switches are in the right place, you have the right number of switches, etc. And the, um, the switch itself is powered by a coin cell, which lasts about a month. And in Chris's case, he has two switches. So on average, he has one going flat about every two weeks. Um, now, if you are out and about, like maybe he's at the hackerspace or he's gone to the movies or something, and the switch goes flat, it means that he can no longer control some functions on his wheelchair. And you might think, well, that's okay, so you swap the battery. The battery case is screwed closed. So he could be in some random place and his carer has to get a screwdriver, unscrew the case, pull it apart, and then of course bits fall over the floor and you lose little screws, pull out the coin cell, put a new one in, screw it all back together again. And this can happen at any time and it happens every couple of weeks. So the first thing he wanted to do was to replace the coin cell power with a voltage regulator so that we could take power from the wheelchair. Because the chair itself has these massive battery packs in it, it's not going flat anytime soon. So we opened up one of these little touch switches to see what was inside and whether we could supply power to it. And we discovered that it was based around a really common little touch IC, which you can buy for about 50 cents in quantity one. It's a bog standard thing. And the manufacturer had basically implemented the reference design for this chip. So at that point we started thinking, well, instead of hacking this one, let's just make our own little PCB. Um, so that's what we started doing. Um, you may notice that I haven't shown you any pictures of the actual touch switch controller or anything. That's because I don't want to reveal the manufacturer because I don't want them to sue me for what I'm going to tell you in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, we'll, get to it. we'll get to that part. So we, um, we made up a little touch switch. You can buy these very commonly on AliExpress. We made our own little 3D printed um, base for it and hacked around on the circuit. So the one on the left is the one from the wheelchair manufacturer. The one on the right is our first prototype, just a 3D printed case with a bit of PCB. Um, we designed a PCB with a, um, a DC jack on it. It's got a switch mode regulator that feeds into a linear regulator so that we can then get a nice smooth power for the, um, the touch sensor. There's a little PCB that makes the, um, the touch contact. Uh, Chris designed a case for it so we can 3D print a little case and the whole thing looks quite nice. Um, we can plug power into it from the chair and we can run it. But the, um, this raises a really big issue in relation to assistive technology. So this is part of the dealer price list from the wheelchair manufacturer. And um, there are a few interesting things on here. Firstly, the, um, oh, so when we were designing this, basically there were, there were under $5 worth of parts in this touch switch that they are selling. So who wants to take a guess? So we've got touch contact. This is their part number for this little touch switch module. Who wants to take a guess how much they charge for this? $50. Sorry, $50, $200, okay. And keep in mind this is US dollars. Whoa. <clears throat> um, okay, now for one that I find really funny. So this says Joyce Knob Foam Ball 42 millimeter. Black. Okay, so you might be thinking how, you might be overthinking this and thinking this is something really complicated, but no, it's literally a foam ball that you could get a piece of foam and cut it with scissors. And um, this photo is taken from an eBay dealer because these things are in such demand that there is a second hand market for them because they are $90. And this is. <laughs> Yes, good comment. It does cost a lot of money to be disabled. So another funny thing on here, uh, we won't go through all of these, this is the last one. This is a, um, a splitter. So basically imagine a little cable, two 3.5 millimeter sockets so you can plug headphones in and then you plug it into one thing. 
So let's just see, like our friends at AliExpress say it's worth 72 cents. Um, they, that same thing, $51. So this is the sort of thing that you're dealing with when you're trying to put together um, systems to, um, to really benefit the people that can use this the most. And that, there are a few reasons for this. Now, I'm standing here kind of mocking these prices, but there are a whole bunch of factors. And um, that includes the disconnection between the, the pricing of the person who is supplying this and the person who is consuming it. And that's because the company that makes this doesn't have to sell this to the end customer. They only have to sell it to the insurance company. And that's where a lot of this comes in. Um, so <coughs> this is really where um, open source can be a market disruptor. And it's where open source can win. So we did the only sensible thing, of course, and we put our design on GitHub. So earlier I we saw the little, um, the little blue box. This is some buttons that are uh, sitting just over the edge of the wheelchair. In this particular one, it's connected to an Arduino Leonardo. Um, I didn't build this one. This was built by the stepfather, Peter. And what it does is sends arbitrary keystrokes or hid events when buttons are pressed. So the way they use their computers is they have a mouse in the right hand and then this little button box on the left. And here's another photo of it while I was modifying it to add some thumb clearance. And what these do is give them the ability to uh, interact with the computer when they can't use a normal keyboard. Now there are some companies that are really helping with this and I'm amazed to say that I'm standing here at a Linux conference praising Microsoft, but recently they released this device which is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. This is a device that you plug into a game system or a computer. It comes up as a game controller and it works exactly like a game controller except that it has 19 inputs along the back. Each one of those inputs corresponds to one of the 19 things you can do on a standard game controller. So if you short one of those inputs, uh, you can just have a switch or something that plugs into it. It could be a foot switch, it could be a sip and puff interface, it really doesn't matter. You can build a custom interface that the game system thinks is a normal game controller. So Microsoft released this and um, we got one. It's really good, but it's primarily oriented around games. So we worked on a, um, another device which we've called the, um, the Open Adaptive Controller. This one's the Mini Open Adaptive Controller. It's only got eight inputs, but basically what it does is it's got USB-C, you plug it into your computer, and it comes up as a human interface device. And if you short one of those inputs simply with a switch or it could be like a large switch so that um, it's easy to activate. And um, Nick always put a funny, a happy face on his designs. So this is a 3D printed switch. You could then trigger arbitrary events on the computer. But this is all digital. This is just pressing buttons. And what we really wanted to do was have analog input as well. And the other thing is that um, one of Nick and Chris's friends, who also has muscular dystrophy, um, didn't receive the, uh, the physiotherapy that would have helped him earlier in life. And the result is that his hands have closed up and he can't open them. So he's not able to use one of these button boxes because his hands won't fit over it. So what we've just been starting to do in recent times is work with these, which are little pressure transducers. They're very sensitive and it allows us to measure pressure. Instead of tuning the switching force in hardware, we can tune it in software. And what we want to do is build a mount that is tuned to the specific shape of the hand of the user. So just last Tuesday, we're almost up to present day, we were experimenting with a technique called photogrammetry. Uh, this is where you take a series of photos of a physical object and then throw it into some really cool software called Meshroom, which is built on Alice Vision, and it's all GPL, it's all open source. It crunches on it for a while, and based on features in all the photos, it figures out where the camera was at all the position where all those photos were taken, and then it builds you a 3D model of whatever it was you took the photo of. So you can, our plan, this is what we're just starting to experiment with, is take a lot of photos, build a 3D model of a person's hand, pull that into Fusion 360, and then we can exactly place the pressure sensors in the optimum position and 
then 3D print supports for it. So, um, final thing is right before coming to LCA, so this was just on Friday, uh, this was at a clinic in Melbourne. We went along for a trial of a device called Neuronode, which is a new type of EMG sensor that detects uh, muscle uh, electrical activity. And um, you can see the, uh, the sensors there on Chris's hand. What this is doing is detecting the, um, the very small muscle activity in his hand. And um, it can auto calibrate so that even with tiny movements, the computer can detect um, that movement and then translate that into an output. So as of Friday, we're now talking to um, Control Bionics, the company that makes this, about taking that input and then feeding it into our open source, uh, open adaptive controller and allowing uh, EMG control of computers as well. So if any of this has been of interest to you, um, there is <laughs> a whole lot of info at superhouse.tv. Um, there are links to GitHub and project pages and videos and live streams and there's a forum and all sorts of stuff. Um, if you want that URL, there are some cards down here with the URL on it, so feel free to grab them at the end. Um, but the final thing I'd like to say uh, is uh, thank you because you have built the open source technology that has allowed us to do all of these projects. It's, um, and you've not just built it, but you've released it as open source so that other people can build on it. So that's how we, how like everybody in this room can help make the world a better place. And then we can build on each other's work. So thank you from Chris, Nick, and myself. Questions. Sure. And for a couple questions. Any questions? Going once. Martin. Thank you, John, very much. Um, when you showed that one image. Um, and you just didn't disclose the company's name. You did so because you were copying their design, and I assume that because we're doing this for a good cause and open source, that's okay. Um, I was wondering, what, what would be your advice to those companies, you know? How could they actually um, help these people better, not making more money, that's their primary goal, I'm sure, but what would need to happen for such companies to be enabled to work with people such as Nick and Chris and yourself and push this out far further than your own reach because not everybody has a John Oxer around, you know? Yeah. Um, my experience is that they are extremely opaque and I think that it's going to take an enormous change in the way they think for anything to happen. This, um, this process of keeping everything close and trying to control it, is, it's very much a, um, a silo sort of mentality. In some ways, it's like uh, home automation was 10 or 15 years ago, before there were really valid uh, open alternatives and before interoperability was seen as a thing. Um, it used to be that you would buy into like the, the CBUS ecosystem or some other ecosystem and nothing was compatible with anything. Uh, and that has changed as people have started taking uh, advantage of point solutions like LifeX globes that you can put in as a single element and you get immediate benefit from it. You don't have to buy an entire ecosystem. And I think um, there will be, we're going to start seeing some benefits as, um, as people take advantage of those sorts of technologies. But how the assistive device manufacturers um, deal with that, I'm not sure. It would be really nice if they could do things like tie into um, APIs at least so that if there was an event um, in relation to, like for a great example is the ventilators that Nick and Chris use. Uh, if their ventilators stop, they, um, they have moments to live, like seconds or minutes. Um, it would be really nice, for example, if the ventilator had some kind of API where if there was an event, 
it could connect out to some arbitrary thing, and that might be make all the lights in your house flash or make an alarm go off or whatever, but make that customizable by exposing the API. But until we get a, a shift in mentality, I don't think that's going to happen. Sorry, that's all we have time for, folks. Of course, you can find Jonathan at superhouse.tv.